What joy it is to be with you this morning. And as we continue now in our worship period, we'll be looking this month. And for this morning's lesson, we're going to be looking at the, the Israel of God. In Galatians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul concluded his letter to the Galatians by saying, As many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And that's what we want to be talking about this morning. I'll go ahead and tell you for this month, this morning we're going to be looking at a history of Israel from its inception to the present time. Tonight I'm asking the question and answering from the Scriptures, who is the Israel of God today? The Lord willing, next Sunday I plan to deal with principles of biblical prophecy. That's so important as we understand the prophetic word. And then the Lord willing that night to look at the land promise. Will Israel once again possess the promised land? A lot of people think that the Bible teaches that. We'll be looking at that. And then on the third Sunday, April the, um, February the 18th I mean to say, February, we're going to be looking at the election of Israel. All Israel will be saved, Romans 11, 26, in context. We'll be talking about the election of grace. And uh, that night as well as the fourth Sunday, Devin will be bringing lessons also related to this, to this theme. Peace be upon the Israel of God. In the beginning, before there was a beginning, God had a plan. And we've looked at, especially last month, how that as we go back to the beginning, as we go back to the book of Genesis, and as we see the creation of all things, and as we see the creation of man, and Adam and Eve placed in the Garden of Eden, we saw the fall of man. We saw how sin entered the world. And the solution was addressed in early form in chapter 3 and verse 15 about a seed that was to come. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So this, this promised seed, we've given attention to that. And that has to do very much with, as it will turn out, the nation of Israel. For as Jesus himself will say in John chapter 4 at verse 22, salvation is of the Jews. And so we're looking this morning, how, how did God go about that. And so we're really looking at the, the birth of the nation. There, there's already selectivity previously in the gene, genealogical records. In Genesis chapter 5 you have the record from Adam through Seth down to Noah. In Genesis 11 you have the genealogy of Noah traced through Shem down to Terah who is the father of Abraham. That's where Genesis, Genesis 11 concludes. So in chapter 12, in chapter 12 we have those specific promises that God gave to Abraham that God would make of him a great nation. And that's, that's in particular what we're going to be looking at this morning and how that unfolded. But that God would make of him a great nation that he would give that nation the land of Canaan. And thirdly, which really takes us back to the beginning of Genesis 3.15, In thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. And so, and so in the time that we have this morning, I'm kind of doing like Stephen did in Acts chapter 7. Do you remember when Stephen was preaching before the Sanhedrin? And he just kind of gave a, an overview of, of the history down to that present time. And so when we think of the, the birth of the nation, it's going to be that Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob. And Jacob has 12 sons, and it's in particular going to be through Judah that the Messiah will come. And so that small band of, in Genesis chapter 46, Jacob and his family, 70 souls will leave Egypt, will leave Israel, and go down to the land of Egypt where they'll join Joseph there. And that's where they will develop into that great 
nation. Time goes on. They become slaves to Pharaoh. And the time came that God said, I'm mindful of the, of the promise that I made to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. And he told Moses that you're to go back to Egypt and you're going to lead my people and we're going to take them to the promised land. And so this is, um, uh, at this point we can already see they've become a numerous people. They've become a great nation. And so that exodus takes place and that takes us down to Mount Sinai, which is very important uh, to the nation of Israel. At Mount Sinai, Moses ascended the very top of the mountain, and it is here that uh, God spoke to him, and Moses was there for 40 days. But at the foothills of the mountain, the, the people were encamped. And what happened as we're studying currently on Sunday mornings in the, in the auditorium class, what happens is that that here Israel will stay at the foothills of Mount Sinai for, well, for 11 months, basically. And what's going to happen during that almost a year is three important things. They are going to receive the law of Moses. This is the covenant that God made with his people Israel. And, and the people said, all that the Lord hath spoken we will do. Sacrifices were made. That was very special. And in connection with that also, there was a central place of worship, the tabernacle, and those who would officiate and serve in the worship, and that is the priesthood. And so this again was a very important development here in God's purpose and plan for the nation of Israel, the, the special people that he had chosen to accomplish his purpose. And this kind of brings us to where we are as, as Aaron is, is currently teaching us um, on Sunday mornings now in the auditorium class. And that is, after that time and after those events, the people left, as the book of Numbers indicates, and ordinarily it's an 11 days journey from Horeb, which is another term for Mount Sinai, to Kadesh Barnea. It's, it's just that, that what should have been an 11 days journey, and, and then they take possession of the land, which is what God charged them to do, turns out to be a 40 year journey. Because this is when the people Though they had said all that the Lord has spoken we will do, and though they had become the people of God, this is when all of them refused to go in. But now, even though the people were unfaithful, God's always faithful, and He would accomplish His purpose. But what happened to the nation of Israel at this point was God basically waited on all these men of war to die, except for Joshua and Caleb. So that's what happens for the next 40 years. And then at the end of that time, Moses died, and under the leadership of Joshua, as the book of Joshua shows, they conquered the land, taking first the central part, and then the southern part, and then going up north, and completely taking control of the land as God had said. And what is very important, even at this point in time, if you might look to this spot right here on the map, because it is here at Shechem, located between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, that all the people of that nation of, of God, that nation of Israel, assembled here. Six tribes on Mount Ebal. That was the Mount of Cursing. Six tribes on Mount Gerizim. That's the Mount of Blessing. And what's very significant here, Joshua 8 tells the story that all the words of the law were read. The Levites and Joshua read all the words of the law and all the people were on the slopes of these two mountains and they could hear it all. And when the blessings of the covenant were read, they said, Amen. And when the curses of the covenant were read, they said, Amen. And that included that if you are unfaithful when you, when you have this good land, God said, I will take you out of this land. The, the, the curse for covenant unfaithfulness was included. But it's very important to see in this phase of God's dealing with, with his people that Joshua is clear to point out in Joshua chapter 21 and verse 43, so Jehovah gave unto Israel all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers and they possessed it and dwelt therein. Now I'm, again it's important for us to see though some of the things we're t touching on as we survey this morning 
will be dealt with in subsequent lessons, such as the land promise. We're going to have a whole lesson just on that. But it's important to see that a lot of people proceed on a presumption that uh, God did not fulfill the land promise to Israel, that they didn't receive the land that was promised to them, but someday they will. And they, they turn on the news. And here this rather tiny spot of land, almost every day, have you noticed, is featured on the news. Maybe five minutes or ten minutes or even more of, of a 30 minute news segment often is devoted to this strategic part of land. But again, the, so there's a lot of attention there and people thinking in terms of whatever happens on the news, it's, well, that must be fulfilling prophecy. Uh, you know, the Bible says they're going to be receiving that land. So this, this may be a development in that. And so people listen to the news with that in mind. We need to see what the Bible says. And verse 45 states it again, except it states it in different words. Uh, 43 says it positively. 45 negatively says, There fail not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. And so it's not a partial fulfillment with more yet to come. The Bible says all came to pass. So at this point we pause in the history of God's people to observe God has now at this point in the biblical study at this point in the, in, the, in the biblical history, God has made of Abraham a great nation, the nation of Israel. And he has given unto them, according to the book of Joshua, the land that he promised. And of course at this point in biblical history, we're still awaiting the coming of that promised seed at that point. And so that had not happened yet in that point of the Old Testament, of course. But the other promises have been fulfilled. Now, we've already seen in obedience to God's instructions. As they received the land, they did so on the basis again of pledging themselves to keep the covenant of God, as we just pointed out in Joshua chapter 8. And what happens is that the people that said that did that. They did that. But Joshua chapter 2 tells us that after the people of that, after Joshua died, and then the people that he led into the land after after they died, it says there arose another generation that knew not the Lord nor the mighty works that he had done for Israel. And so it talks about in, in disobedience to the promise that they had made, it talks about how that God's people began to worship the gods of the nations round about them. And God disciplined his people. During this time, he allowed them to fall into the hands of enemies who would oppress them. And the pattern is that they would then this is the story of the book of Judges. They would cry out to the Lord for deliverance. And they would put away those false gods. And that's when God would raise up a judge who would deliver them. And again the pattern is and this cycle is that there would be peace in the land until that judge died. But then it will say typically that again the children of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so this is the, the pattern that continues. And, and again that's, that's unfortunate that's wrong. And the people that did that were unfaithful. But now that doesn't speak of everybody. But it's speaking of the nation as a whole. There's, there's repeated apostasy and coming back and apostasy and back and forth. But the Bible tells us in the book of Ruth chapter 1 and verse 1 in the days when the judges ruled. It's still in the days when the judges ruled that were introduced to Naomi and Elimelech and their sons and their wives. That's in chapter 1. And again as we fast forward to chapter 4, the record actually goes back <coughs> in verse 18 to Peretz who is the son of Judah. Remember we said earlier, remember we said earlier that uh, it would be through Judah that the Messiah would come. And Judah had five sons, but this is the son of Judah, Perez. And so the narrative continues. Uh, Hezron, Ram, Amenadab, Nashon, Salmon, and then to bring us up to date to that narrative, Boaz, who married Ruth, begat Obed. Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse is the father of David. You see, this is it's refreshing. I'll tell you, when you're reading the last few chapters of 
of judges, it's, it's terrible. When every man did what was right in his own eyes, and there you're talking about the people of God, his nation, Israel, it's awful. You're reading about idolatry. You're reading, well, there's no other, there's no nice way to put it. You're reading about gang rape. You're, re you're reading about homosexuality. And, and on the list goes, and it's like, this is, this is awful. Chapter 17 through 21 in Judges. When you get to Ruth, it's like, oh, there's a breath, breath of fresh air. It's so refreshing. A godly man here, Boaz and, and, and Ruth, uh, a godly woman. And God is using them even though all of this seems to be going haywire. It's just, it's just chaos. We see that no God is on the throne. And that still coming out of this people, his nation, he's mindful of that lineage. And so his plan continues. Now that brings us in biblical history. We're talking this morning about the nation of Israel. And so after this period of the judges you have a time of monarchy. You have a time of, of we call it the United Kingdom. That's anticipating the fact the kingdom will divide, of course. But with the United Kingdom, you have the first king is Saul, who started out in such a good way, but because of his disobedience, he was taken off the throne. But as um, 1 Samuel 13, verse 14 says, God found a man after his own heart. And so what we find is that David then was the next king. And what's so significant about David as it pertains to our lesson is found in 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is a very important passage. This is one of those messianic prophecies where, where though in the context he had wanted to build the Lord a house, it hurt his, his own heart and conscience that he had a nice house, but, but the ark was in a tent. And, and he, so he wanted to build a temple. He wanted to build a house for the Lord and at first Nathan said, well, that sounds like a good idea. You go ahead. But God appeared to Nathan the prophet and said, no, you go, you go tell David, you're not to build me a house, but the Lord will make you a house. So that becomes the occasion for this messianic prophecy. But it's not going to be in his lifetime. Verse 12 says, when your days are fulfilled and you will sleep with your fathers. Now sleep here is the euphemism for death. This is after you are dead, that it will be your seed after you. And I will establish his kingdom and build a house for my name and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This Davidic promise is a, well it's a development in God's working with his people Israel where, where he has, has, has specified more. He's, you see revelation did not come the whole thing at one time. It's bit by bit. But this is a very important one. And one thing to remember is, I'm fast forwarding just a moment. But when you open the New Testament and you come to Acts chapter 2 and we come to that well-known day of Pentecost and the first gospel sermon, Peter is going to refer to this passage. And he'll say, being thus referring to David, he said, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would raise up the Christ to sit upon his throne. And so he's talking about how that fulfilling that he raised Jesus from the dead and God has made him both Lord and Christ. This is a very important passage and Peter will refer to this on the day of Pentecost showing the fulfillment of that. But again we're talking this morning about the nation of Israel and, and God's purpose with that nation. So one a passage I really appreciate is Acts chapter 13 and verse 36 where it tells us that David accomplished or served the purpose of God in his generation. That's a wonderful thing to be able to say, that you've served the purpose of God in your life, in your generation. But this world is not our home, and all flesh is as grass, and so the time came that David passed. But he was succeeded by his son Solomon, the wisest man in all the earth. And he prayed for wisdom. God granted him wisdom as the, sea, as the sand upon the seashore. And so Solomon was known for his wisdom, but he was also known for his wealth, and he was known for his works, and unfortunately he was known for his women. And 1 Kings chapter 11 tells us that when he was old, his wives turned away his heart from serving God. That's very sad. 
and it's just one of those always a timely thing to point out to all of us how important it is the spouse that you choose because the wisest man in all the world fell flat on his face spiritually speaking when he was not careful in terms of the selection of a spouse. And so again there, there's, that, that, that sets the stage for what happens next and that is the kingdom divides. And this was punitive. It's because of Solomon's unfaithfulness that God tore away the northern tribes and gave them to Jeroboam. Now, now the prophet Ahijah communicated that. That doesn't mean that God had changed his mind about the Davidic dynasty, the messianic promise, but again the kingdom divided and so what was left was the much smaller kingdom to the south. But here again that's that's important to see and we, we reiterate sometimes that though man was unfaithful, God's people often were unfaithful, God's always faithful and He's going to bring about His purpose and His promises and His covenant. He's always mindful of that. To give you an example of the kind of thing that takes place during this period and that's all we're going to take time to do is just as we look at this divided kingdom period just, just take a one kind of a snippet, but it, it tells a lot. It tells a whole lot about what's going on here. And that is down in Judah, you've got a good king named Jehoshaphat. But then his son Jehoram married Jezebel and Ahab's daughter, Athaliah. And so he turns out to be a king that is very disobedient. He's a bad king. And so the inspired writer pauses to tell us, well, why does God let him live? Why is it that um, he, just, he just continues on? Why doesn't God do something about that? And so the, the text says, even though he was wicked, and it just says he killed all of his brothers when he came to the throne. Verse 6 says in 2 Chronicles 21, he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Now hold on, this is the king of Judah. But he did like the kings of Israel, those wicked kings did. For he had the daughter of Ahab as a wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. But verse 6 says, verse 7 says, Yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David. And since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. I'm, I'm stressing some things there as you heard. The house of David, the covenant, the promise of God. And, the, and he's just pausing to explain. It's not that God is a respecter of persons. Jehoram deserved to be put to death. His house deserved to be put to death. But God did not do that. Now as you're a student of this period of time. God did do that in Israel. You start out with Jeroboam and he introduces this calf worship and he's succeeded by Nadab and then Baasha comes to the throne. He kills the whole house, doesn't spare anybody. And Baasha is succeeded by Elah and then Zimri rises up and all the house of Baasha is destroyed. And Omri rises up and he destroys the house of Zimri. And then you've got Omri and Ahab and his son Ahaziah who died childless, and he succeeded by his son Jehoram. And when Jehu was anointed by the prophet of God to kill the whole house of Ahab, he did that thoroughly. He destroyed the whole house of Ahab, even uh, friends, anybody that was close to Ahab. Don't you see that there were times, several times already by this point in biblical history, that the dynasty up in Israel had been cut off. It would come to an end and it would not continue. And this is just pausing to say God didn't let that happen in Judah. He kept that lineage going. And here again while you're at this point I want you to think about for three successive generations when Jehoram killed all of his brothers he was the only one left. Well when he's on the throne then there's some raiders that come through, Arabian and Philistine raiders and they take all of his sons away and they kill them. They took everyone except Ahaziah. That just left one son. 
And then when Jehu killed Jehoram to the north, he also killed Ahaziah. And that's when Ahaziah's mother, Athaliah, usurped the throne. And the first thing she did was to kill all of Ahaziah's sons, her own grandchildren, every one of them. She killed them all. Except the high priest Jehoiada found and saved baby Joash, who was one year old. And they kept him hidden. He and his wife Jehosheba kept him hidden for six years. And then he was put on the throne. Don't you see? That's not just kind of narrating something that's happened. That's the fact that God is reaching down. We have clearly divine intervention because that's not by accident. That three successive generations, three in a row, the Davidic promise is in the mind of God. He kept that lamp burning. He didn't let that lamp be extinguished because he had promised, because he had made a covenant with David, because he had a purpose with his nation of Israel, and in particular now with the tribe of Judah and through his servant David, who was of the tribe of Judah. And so the writer wants you to know that's why God kept that lamp burning. But the people of Israel first were carried away into captivity by the Assyrians. And then later, Judah alone was left, and they were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And that captivity lasted for 70 years. The Bible teaches this. And then God brought up to the throne a leader named Cyrus. And after that 70 years of, of captivity, Cyrus allowed the first of the captives to return. There would be three returns, but the Cyrus cylinder that's on display in the British Museum records how that this king allowed the Jews and people of other nations, for that matter, to go back. And, and there's some specificity in the biblical record of, of things that were involved in the edicts that were, that were sent forth specifically about going back to rebuild the temple. And so under Zerubbabel, the temple would be rebuilt. Later, a second group would come under Ezra. And then a third group would return in the year 444 under Nehemiah, and the wall would be rebuilt. And once that happens, we enter into that period of biblical silence. Amos 8 and verse 11 had said, But the days are coming, saith the Lord, that I will send forth a famine in the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst of water, but a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. And what that means is that though the prophetic word had gone forth in such abundance, both with the literary and non-literary prophets, now there would be a period of, of silence. Because what's happening is God is simply waiting on what the Bible would call in Galatians 4 and verse 4, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of woman and born under the law, to redeem those that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, I don't want to overwhelm you. I don't want to underwhelm you. I just want to whelm you. But this is a place to take a breath, because what we've done is survey the Old Testament in terms of the history of Israel, from the birth of the nation all the way into the coming of Christ. And what we need to just pause and see is that God has accomplished at this point His purpose with a nation. It's so significant that when Jesus said salvation is of the Jews, when Micah foretold in Micah chapter 5 that the daughter of Zion would be in labor, she would travail and bring forth the man-child, that's the Christ. He, he, has, he has come. And so God's, God's purpose that, that through that chosen nation, that Christ who would bring salvation was ushered into the world. And a second very important thing, when Paul would raise the question in a book that teaches God is no respecter of persons, the book of Romans, that the gospel is for all, same plan of salvation for all Jews and Gentiles, he will raise the question out of all fairness in Romans chapter 3, and he will say, what advantage then has the Jew, or what is the prophet of circumcision? And then he answers this question. He will say, much in every way, <clears throat> but chiefly unto them were committed the oracles of God. 
Have you thought about that? Not only does, does Christ the Savior come through that chosen nation, but this is a product of God using the Jewish people. All the Old Testament written by Jews. And the New Testament, Luke was a Gentile, but otherwise you, you have Jewish authors. But they took that job seriously. They, they copied, they were careful, and, and we have this book today because of God's use of His chosen people. And that's a very, very important point. But let me just close out by saying this, that as we think further about Israel up to the present time, I'm not going to take time that I can make this available to you. Th these are just bullet points. So, so what happens? What, we, we've talked about the Israel of God, and clearly Paul is writing to, to the churches of Galatia, and so we see the Israel of God today, the people saved by grace, people that, whether Jew or Gentile, have come to the Lord for salvation. But, but what happens next? Well, as Jesus foretold, Jerusalem was destroyed. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus prophesied that not one stone would be left upon another. And so the, the temple and the temple complex, all that, so AD 70, the Romans destroyed it. There was subsequent rebellion, but in the year 135, the Jews were banished from even being in the land of Israel. They continued to be under Roman rule, really until the year 363, and that's when you enter the Byzantine period. And then Israel is under the control. I'm talking about the land of Israel now, the under Arab control. But then you have the Crusades and the Ayyubid, which uh, Solomon, the Magnificent, and um, Saladin is what I meant to say, rather. And, and he, is, he is the leader of the Crusades here at this point, uh, the, the leader of the Muslim element against the Crusades and de defeats the Crusaders is what I'm trying to say. Then you have the late Arab period, and then you have Israel under control of the Ottoman, and then you've got the British mandate that takes you to the year 1848. It's then in the year 1848 that the modern state of Israel began, 1948. And one day after that was declared, the modern state of Israel, war broke out. And several countries combined forces against Israel, and Israel defeated them. And the result of that was that their land expanded, as well as Jerusalem was declared to be the capital of Israel. In the year 1956, in a battle with Egypt, they defeated Egypt and the Sinai. And then more recently, in 1967, there was the Six-Day War. And as a result of this, Israel tripled its land. And now it has, the, as of this point, has the Golan Heights. Now it has the western part of Jerusalem. That western wall, the Wailing Wall, that became again back to the state of Israel in 1967. I want to close though, again, time forbids me dealing with that more, but I want to close by making the point that what we see in these subsequent years when, when we think in terms of uh, the history of Israel from, from after the, uh, from, from the time of, that we looked at from A.D. 70 to the, to the present time, to think of that and, and, and then reading back and identifying the modern state of Israel with biblical Israel is really a mistake. Let me show you what I mean. The, the nation of Israel we read about in the Bible was established under the law of Moses. The law of Moses has been nailed to the cross. And so we could not say that the modern state of Israel is under the law of Moses. That's one point out. God allowed for Israel to have a king. And modern Israel has no king. He allowed for Israel to possess the land. And modern Israel possesses part of the land. Israel had a temple as a place of worship. Central place of worship. And there is no temple associated with uh, modern, the modern state of Israel today. In fact, you might not know this, but the Temple Mount does not belong to the modern state of Israel. That's the proper, that, in other words, when you see that golden dome, 
that is a Muslim shrine. That goes back into the 600s AD. So all of that, that Temple Mount is actually under the ownership of uh, the, the Islamic people. Israel of old had, had a priesthood. And you see in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 12 that the priesthood has been changed. You, you had animal sacrifices that were offered and that's not the case with modern Israel. You had identifiable tribes with the biblical nation of Israel, but you have no tribal identity that is really possible today with a modern state of Israel. So that's the lesson this morning. But we conclude by saying that God has a plan to save Israel. He has a plan to save everyone. And it's the same plan for all. This is a point that Paul makes in the book of Galatians. Chapter 3 and verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And that, my friends, is the nation of God today. This is that to which Paul referred when he said, Peace be upon the Israel of God. And so God has one plan, one gospel for all, for Jew and Gentile. If you've not yet obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to come this morning as together we stand and sing. Amen.